Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. Presented by QWare. Maintain excellence. The biggest player for me was when I sat down in a race car and put the window net up, put my helmet on. That was where I was at peace. I read in an interview that Ernie did with Grand National Illustrated back in the late 80s, early 90s. And he said that your dad, George, decided to take the team Winston Cup racing back in the mid-70s. And Ernie said that the two of you kind of maybe disagreed with that, that maybe you were stepping up a little too soon. Oh, absolutely. I mean... Do you really? My dad always wanted us to... He felt like that was the future of racing, is what NASCAR was all about. And he kind of kept pushing us to go that direction. But, you know, I hadn't done anything but short track race in the local area there around home. And, you know, to step into a cup car at that point in time... Uh, was was a, a far step of where I needed to go, I felt like. Yeah. I, and, and Ernie and I, we talk a lot, and, I mean, we're just trying to be honest about it. But, you know, my dad, when he gets something in his head, he was hard to, to change. <laughs> so there you go. Here we are. Does that run in the family? It could. <laughs> I think Ernie got the brunt of it. Now, those early years, you pretty much stuck exclusively to the bigger tracks like Daytona, Talladega, Atlanta, Charlotte, Michigan, and so forth. Was that because they paid more, or maybe they suited your driving style better? Yeah, the reason we went to them, A, is you know we, we tried to focus on the races that would get you more coverage. You know, so okay. if you ran well, you know, you if you went to any of the short tracks, you know, I mean, you take, for example, look what the Woods Brothers did and a lot of the guys did in that era. You know, they didn't even show up to a lot of places yeah. as, as time went on there. So we felt like that if you, A, they, they paid better money if you did make the race, which still wasn't a lot of money back in those days. But still, that was the, the biggest thing that we looked at was, was, A, if you got, you know, they might be on a, a some sort of television deal at some point in time yeah. as time went on and... So that's kind of the way we looked at it. There were some pretty interesting stories in Grand National scene back in those early days that kind of spoke to the difficulties that you guys were having keeping up financially. You were able to go to the second race at Michigan in 1978 after some fans collected some money for you. And then there was another story in 1980 that said that you'd had to go find an actual nine to five job. Well, that was probably in the near future, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, back then, I mean, you got to understand where we came from. I mean, my dad, we the the first cup car we had was an old Richie Panch car that he got somehow he got from Bobby Allison. I don't have any idea what he paid Bobby for that thing, but it was a it was just a pretty well used up old Torino, Ford Torino, and then we kind of nursed it along and you know went to some races and. You know, we were we were kind of doing things, and you know, we were doing everything we could do. I mean, the, the shop we had there at Dawsonville, we we would burn. We'd go out and cut wood, and we'd burn. And we had a wood stove, so we used. <laughs> I mean, we yeah, and we did everything we could. And I mean, I didn't have any equipment. I mean, I had a. Well, that's how they heat Hendrick Motorsports, isn't it? Uh, yeah, with a wood stove. <laughs> cut wood and do that. Yeah. I told Rick, uh, to get off on that, I told Rick I went to his shop back several years ago, and I said, if I'd had a race team and come up here and went through your shop, I'd have went straight home and closed my shop. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, it was just a, a tough time. I mean, we, we struggled in a lot of different ways. I mean, we'd go, we'd go around a hotel room and sleep about 10 people in it. We'd take the mattress on no the kidding. box springs. We did everything wow. we could do. I mean, but... We had no money. We, I mean, and and back then, I mean, we were trying to get four and five hundred dollars just to go to, you know, to, to help out yeah. to go to a race. And I mean, you talk about five hundred dollars, you can't take, you know, a yeah. handful of people out and have lunch, have a dinner, right, and not spend close to that this yeah. day and time. Was there ever a point where you were maybe close to walking away from the sport, or was there just enough hope? You know, you were getting some pretty decent finishes. Well, I, it wasn't till till really Harry Mellon came along okay. that we finally was able to at least have some glimmer of a chance. Yeah. I mean, before that, you had no chance. I mean, right. yeah, we ran decently a time or two, and you know, we just we survived when a lot of people didn't, and we ran 
you know, relatively okay, but, you know, there was still, you look back then and, you know, the attrition of the cars and the, the, the way people race in were a lot different than what they are today. So it's, uh, you know, I'm sure there was times I felt like I probably needed to go get a nine to five job or a, it, for us, it was like all day and all night job. Yeah. That's what we did pretty much in that, in that era. Now, late 1978, you rented an Oldsmobile from Benny Parsons to run at Atlanta. How did that come about? And also, how big a deal was it for you to be running something other than a Ford? Well, my dad struggled with that decision pretty hard. <laughs> but at the point in time, we just wanted to try something just to see what what difference there was. And uh we we tried it, and which Ernie was doing engines for a lot of different manufacturers at that point in time, and we were doing some for Chevrolet and you know s- some Ford stuff. So, you know, we just thought we would. Uh, Benny had an extra car, and we thought we would give it a try and see what it was like. And you know, I think at the point in time things changed there in a pretty short period of time after that, and you know it it made it more I think uh, easier for a Ford to run or or start to be more competitive for a four right. run. And then yeah. we just felt like that we focused on it and do what we needed to do. And then that would make Daddy happy. So we, that's what we did. Now, you went to Michigan in the fall of 1980, and apparently you did get a couple of offers of help. From what I understand from Grand National Scene, one guy offered you a ton of money for the next year's Daytona 500, and that was about twice as much as what Harry was offering for the whole season, yet you went with Harry. Well, you know, I don't remember. I, I just know when we sat down with, with with Harry Melling, it was kind of a deal it, that Ernie and I, I'll never forget, we drove, we got in a pickup truck and drove to Michigan straight through, met with him, turned around, got in the truck and drove back. And, you know, Harry, I never had a contract with Harry. I mean, we Did just, you not? We, no, we never had, we had never had no kind of agreement. I mean, it <laughs> I mean, he did what he said he was going to do, and I did what I said I was going to do. And, I mean, that's where we left it. And, I mean, he was he was just that kind of guy. And, I mean, he he did the world for us. But, 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 you, but you look back and you look at all the people that helped get you to that point. I mean, Benny Parson was, was a very strong figure that helped us get involved with, with, with Harry Melling. And, you know, he was doing oil pump business and um, – Benny was uh, a sales rep for a lot of the product that Harry was selling at that point in time. So a lot of things came together and a lot of things made it work out. And that was the, man, that was just a key part. You know, you, you know, you, you open a lot of doors throughout your lifetime, you know, and, and we got a, a little toe stuck in it. And then we got another toe and another toe. And finally it kind of, kind of came together. And finally you kicked it in. That, well, it, it, it was still a point of a lot of struggle, a lot of hard work, and a lot of dedication. And, you know, when I look back at my upbringings and all the, the worth ethic that my dad taught me at the point in time early on is if it hadn't been for that, we'd have never made it by no means. All of us, the, the Dan and Ernie both. Yeah. Once you finally got a little bit of backing from Harry – and you had a little bit of breathing room, how much of a difference was there for you? Did it allow you to maybe concentrate on actually racing a little bit? Uh, we were just still doing more. I mean, at that point in time, you, you had – there was just a few of us. I mean, in in the early 80s, there was, there was myself and Ernie that did all the car stuff, and then we had guys around that helped us from time to time uh, put things together. And – you know, you just had no, you had nothing. I mean, and and back then it was, you know, you tried to prepare and focus yourself. Like for example, we we worked all winter long to go to Daytona, and you know, Daytona was a race that kind of would make you or break your year, you know. And and then we went down there in '79, and we missed the race, and that was kind of devastating because you know you spent a lot of time and a lot of effort, and we were fast enough to make the race but we just had problems in the 125 so you know it's just uh i never thought that i ever made it i just i just worked and tried to keep the goal of you know whatever happened the past sunday there's another sunday coming up we need to 
we need to fix our mistakes and try to be better or, or try to run better as time goes on. I always look to the future. I never look to the past. And, you know, with and when, Mar- and when Harry Mellon came along, we just tried to put it, keep putting things together. And, you know, at the end of, uh, let's see, he sponsored us for, what, uh, 10 or 12 races in 81, and then we went into 82, and he ended up buying the team from my dad, which it was nothing there really to buy a couple of cars and some few parts and pieces. And uh, So this and wasn't a multi-million dollar transaction? More like about a couple of thousand. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, I mean, I don't know what my dad got out of the stuff. I mean, it couldn't have been a lot of money at the point in time because, like I said, we just didn't have anything. And then we went on to into 82, and, and Harry sat down with us and said, you know, we'll run – whatever races you feel comfortable running because we'd only run, you know, 12 or so, 10 or 12 the past number of years. So in 82, I think we ran close to 20 races. And then in 83, he decided, we kind of put it together and said, hey, let's try to run all the races. And, you know, then by the end of 83, you know, we we had some, we started racking up some pretty good finishes and and running pretty good. So, but you know, you look at eighty one and uh, from eighty to eighty one, so many things changed. You know, yeah. the cars changed from the big, from the very big cars, to smaller cars. So you were starting out more on an equal basis. Then, then your manufacturers started getting more involved as the eighties rolled on, and and Ford started to be more more on the scene and the 83 T-Bird came out and it was kind of a, a real step ahead of everybody else because aerodynamically it was it was such a, a slick car and so when really when 83 came along that was kind of put everything together and we were able to to win the the last race at Riverside in 83 and then then 84 we just started putting more things together and things started coming together and we were we were rolling, and when 85 came along, it was like everything just hit right on the money. But then by the time 86 came along, it was, you know, we had worked so hard through 85, it took its toll on us in 86. I think we weren't, there wasn't enough of us to really brunt what we were trying to do year in, year out. How big a deal was it to win that race at Riverside? Oh, it was huge. I mean, it was, I mean... We felt like we were close to winning, and I never, you know, I never looked at things of being that it's, I've got to win a race. I just felt like if we just keep trying and keep going, and, you know, things would hopefully eventually come together, and, and they did. You go into 1984, and you do win those three races, and you got sponsorship from Coors and all that, and things were definitely looking up. But with more success on the racetrack, you started to get more attention from a lot of different places. Was that something that you were used to? Absolutely not. I mean, I was more comfortable under the race, <laughs> not in front of the camera. You don't say. <laughs> and, and I had a, I, I struggled with that a lot. And, and you know, you, you look through, and that's what I tell people today, that, you know, you don't understand until you get put in this position. I mean, in, in high school, I couldn't get up in front of a group of three or four people and say two words. Holy cow. You know, I, yeah. I was yeah. the shyest person yeah. probably in the classroom. And to be, to be to come from that and be able to be put in the position you were put into eight, in 1985 was like light years. And and then you, you try to put it in perspective from our side. I mean, we were working 24-7. I mean, we were doing everything we could yeah. do to get stuff done, you know. And, and, I, and I definitely – made some people mad you know i'll be the first to admit that and i i probably set some wrong examples in a lot of ways but but i was handling the things the best i could with what that at the point in time we did and i finally after a period of time i realized hey look there there's a there's a time for media there's a time for fans there's a time for the race car and there's a personal time you know when we and i said look we need to separate this out. And by the, I think by the end of the, by the end of '85, by the time we got to Darlington, things were fine. I finally got kind of things halfway figured out. I didn't yeah. have everything figured out, but I was able to kind of keep my sanity and and be able. And the the biggest pleasure for me was when I sat down in a race car and put the window net up, put my helmet on. I mean, that was that was my time. That was my I got away from everybody and everything, and that yeah. was that was where I, I I was at peace. So. You know, you look at kind of what it drew you into, and 
it just helps you more and more getting a race car because the thing you love to do, you know, you had to put up with a lot of stuff outside of that, but you could, you were starting to be able to put things in perspective. And, you know, it's like, I'll give you one example as, as 85 went through there. It's like, you you know, used to, you'd walk through through downtown Dawsonville. I mean, there wasn't that many people there anyway, but you'd say, you know, you'd meet somebody and say, hey, how you doing, you know, and and, and go from there. And then by the time 85 rolled along, it, it's like somebody would walk up to me <laughs> and they, yeah. I'd, I'd look at them and say, what do you want? Because they want something. You know, instead yeah. of being the person you were, it changed you into something, yeah. the person you really wasn't. And I think that's what I admire about some of the people. I mean, you look at you look at Richard Petty and what he's done for the sport and, and some of the guys that's been able to to go through a lot of difficulties and still maintain their presence and kind of the personality that they are. But, you know, he was he was able to come through and learn, you know, it's just like all of us. We all had bad times. You know, in today's society, is too quick to pick up the telephone and videotape anything you say wrong or yes, anything sir. you do wrong. Yeah. And back then, you know, you could make mistakes and learn from them and go on, and they didn't come back to every time you pick something up, the social media world is picking it up and saying, yeah. oh, he said this or he said that, or we're yeah. taking it out of contact. And, and I think that's where I disagree with a lot of things in today's world is – you're too vulnerable in, in things of happening today versus what used to could happen and, and, and learn and live and work through things. And, you know, now it's just all about, well, we've got to be on this or, you know, we've got to have everything out. And it, it's just like if, if I'd had the deal back in the 80s, for me back then it was like, well, when you're going to win a race, it wasn't like pressure on me to win a race. It was like supporting you to win a race. And now yeah. in today's world it's like, they just put pressure on you. Yeah. Hey, when are you gonna win a race? It's like, hey, you gotta win a race, or we're gonna bash on social media. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. I don't know. It's just such a different time and space. And I, I really, I look back on all the things and all the people that that you touched and affected throughout your career, and the things, the fun that I had, and and really, I had a lot of fun through my deal, and I enjoyed a lot of it, and I felt like and. You know, I, I still talk to some of the – like every time we go to the racetrack, I usually run into Dale Inman, and he and I with <laughs> Dale. Dale's always funny and, and comes up with something, and we'll laugh about – Boy, I'd like to be a fly on that wall. Oh, it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> and, and we talk about things, and, and really the the times we didn't embrace what we did, and that's what I try to tell – you know, especially Chase today, I said, embrace where you're at because it's not going to be this way forever. Yeah. I said, you know, things will change. And I said, it may be difficult now, but embrace where you're at and and and, and try not to worry about stuff as much. And and that's, I, I worried about a lot of things, but but then as time went on, I looked back on it and some of the stuff I was worried about is, is the least important thing on the face of the earth yeah. at, at some points in time. So yeah. here you go. When the Winston Million program was announced prior to the 1985 season, did you have any reaction to it? Was that a goal that you guys set out, or was that something that evolved as races started to pile up? Let me tell you, I was sitting in the Waldorf when they announced that deal, and I was and uh, it? was it Jerry Long with with Winston? Yes, sir. Yeah. He was, he was going through the program. I'll never forget it. I mean, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I was sitting there at the table, and we'd had a good year. Uh, you know, 84 was a good year for us. And they said, okay, we're going to we're gonna give a million dollars to a guy that can win three of these four races. And, you know, if you win Daytona and you win, you know, uh, Talladega and you win Charlotte and you win or win Darlington, well, I hadn't won at Daytona and I hadn't won here and I hadn't won there, <laughs> uh, but I won at Charlotte. Yeah. You know, Man, that'd be nice. And that's you know, I was thinking to myself, man, that'd be nice. And that's all I could think. <laughs> <laughs> and and lo and behold, here we are right in the middle of it when the season started. And I had it was I mean, I I'll guarantee if you went to Vegas and put odds on it, it'd have been a you could have probably won the lottery easier, you know. So I don't Wow. Know. You win the Daytona five hundred and then you go to Talladega and you have an oil fit and break loose and all that, lose close to a couple of laps. What was your thinking while you were sitting on pit road as the crew was fixing what was wrong? I didn't really, probably didn't think anything. I mean, just other than, 
hey, can you fix it? What can we do? What are we doing? Uh, and that's about it. I mean, I don't, I don't recall what I was thinking at the moment, but I'm sure it was probably race related. Yeah. You go back out on the racetrack, almost two laps down, and you make those up without a caution. How? Well, you you got uh, you got to understand the the era of what we were racing against. You know, when when we're when we're in the garage area, you know, we were you know you're watching all other guys kind of doing their things, and they're you know you normally feel like the race pace is going to slow down. Well, yeah. Daytona and Talladega normally don't, you know, because you get in a draft and you turn more RPMs. So most of the guys were putting gears where their engines would turn more RPMs rather than less RPM. So we're sitting there in, in you know, we're in the garage and, and kind of, I'm kind of, you know, listening to these guys and, you know, we're doing this and that and, and we gear our car higher. And so we're turning less RPM. So it's, it's easier on the motor. It's not as taxing on the motor. Well, you know, the race starts out and it unfolds and, you know, we're kind of rolling along there and, well, the race pace picks up pretty good. Well, heck, most of them guys blow their motors up. I mean, you look at the you look at the attrition, especially Daytona and Talladega back in that era. It was pretty bad. And you know, then most of the guys is is they're out of engine because they're turning more RPMs than what their motor will let them. So they'll get to a point and they'll nose over and they'll they'll make less power when they get to a point and and even if they live through the race. So we're sitting there and and, and we're kind of figuring all this and and I mean it was just and we had a good slick race car and it was you know Ernie Ernie at the point in time I think is is the most underrated motor guy on the planet. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I mean yeah. I've said that a thousand times. I mean he's he's not the most politically correct guy. <laughs> but I'm telling you what, I've watched him work weeks hand grinding cylinder heads back yeah. in that day. And and he made good power, good reliable power. And and shoot, that was a key to, that was ninety percent the key of our success. I mean he, he usually we had very few motor failures in those times. And I mean he was just he was such a perfectionist and so anal about what he did, it it was crazy but as far as his people skills he was <laughs> he was probably a little rougher than the rest of yeah, us and we yeah. were all rough at that point in time but uh but anyway the it just kind of unfolded to to fall right into our hands by the way everything unfolded that particular day you know when as time went on things changed you know when people wised up to what you needed to do race wise but but i don't think they were prepared for what the racing did and, and you know it's just like as as you get older and you race and you kind of get set in your ways and a guy comes along and does something a little different you look at him and say well you can't do it that way well they prove you wrong and, that, yeah. and that's kind of what we did you know we kind of did things because you know we we weren't a part of the established team so we did things what we felt like was the correct way and it went against the grain of what the racing world would have done. So here you go. And and like I said, it just kind of fell. Everything just fell into place. 